Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome uh, to our in-person and to our virtual audiences. I'm Stephen Davey, senior producer here at City Space. It's so good to see so many shining faces on a Tuesday. Um, thank you all for coming out. Before we get started, I want to say uh, and make a little plug for our newsletter we just launched. And the author of it is here somewhere, Barb. She's a great reporter. It's called Cooked. Uh, and it's all about the search for sustainable eats and you can and how you can reduce your impact on climate change. Uh, it's also funny and loaded with excellent food puns. <laughs> uh, and a bonus, it features a couple of the Korean vegans' recipes and Irene Lee's recipes from May May, so that's very cool. Um, sign up at wbur.org slash cooked. Now, how many of you are TikTokers? Mm, okay, all right. Uh, how many of you are vegan, vegetarian, vegan curious? You're in for a treat. Um, okay, so Joanne Lee Molinaro, perhaps better known, thank you, Adam, uh, is better known as the Korean vegan. Uh, she uses plant-based cooking and refreshes and re-inspires classic Korean cuisine. Joanne is a lawyer by trade, New York Times best-selling author, and now a James Beard Award nominee. She started sharing her 60-second recipes to TikTok in just July 2020. Uh, and that's not just her delicious-looking food, where she found more than 3 million followers. It's also her commentary on social justice issues and stories about her family's remarkable immigrant journey from North Korea. Joanne's new cookbook, The Korean Vegan Cook Cookbook, Reflections and Recipes from Omas Kitchen, is available in the lobby. It's beautiful uh, via our partners at Brookline Booksmith. Thank you. And Joanne will be signing copies afterwards, so hang on and uh, wait in line for that. Um, also, after the conversation, join us and taste, you see, what Joanne's going to be demonstrating in just a little bit, prepared by our partners over at Boston University's Food and Wine Program. Thank you to them. And leading us on our culinary journey tonight, Irene Lee, co-founder of May May Restaurant Group here in town and Prep Shift. Now, please give a warm welcome to Joanne Lee Molinaro. <laughs> Joanne, it is such a treat to be here with you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah seriously. Um, I think one of the first things I want to say is that we were just talking backstage about representation. And for me, as an Asian American woman, <laughs> to get to sit here with you, someone who I have a few things in common with, is really a special moment. So thank you for that. And one of the reasons that I think we have a lot of things in common is because the first recipe I ever saw you make was your kimchi crunch wrap supreme. <laughs> and that really spoke to me. <laughs> it speaks so, to everyone. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, and so I was wondering if we could just sort of start with talking about your, your journey toward veganism. Um, yeah. Such an interesting story. Yeah, it was a, a short journey, um, but it was a not without controversy, <laughs> I guess. Um, my now husband, then boyfriend, who's somewhere here, he, um, he wanted to go plant-based, he wanted to go vegan, and I think my initial reaction was like, okay, well, you do that, and I'm not, so. <laughs> um, and I think I had a lot of skepticism about it as a diet. I was paleo, which is about as far on the other side of that diet as you could possibly be. I was also Korean, and I identified with my food on a cultural level. So as far as I knew, there was no such thing as Korean vegan food. So I was worried that if I joined him, I would no longer be able to eat Korean food, which, you know, is not just an elimination of the food, but then also an undermining of the relationship that I had with my family and my culture. So there was a lot of things that kind of made me be like, okay, you do that and I'm not going to do that. And he, you know, adopted that plant-based diet and in his campaign to get me to join him he had me watch all the movies like Food Inc and Cowspiracy and Forks Over Knives all very compelling um, but not compelling enough I guess uh, for me to change my mind about it 
Um, but there were a lot of different things that ultimately led me to saying, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. One of them was, you know, the inconvenience factor <laughs> of having to cook two different dishes for every meal. I was like, oh, this is getting kind of tired. <laughs> like, I don't like this. Um, the other was, of course, me feeling like I couldn't enjoy um, fellowship with my partner anymore, or at least some of that was kind of being diluted by the fact that we were no longer eating the same foods together or enjoying them together. And then finally, and I you know, talk a little bit about this in the book, what ultimately kind of sealed the deal for me was when my father was diagnosed with cancer. And it was a very jarring kind of situation because in one of the movies, there was a discussion about this very um, marked correlation between East Asian men uh, experiencing a sharp increase in the occasion of uh, prostate cancer, as well as the westernization of their diet, which meant that they were consuming far more red meat than they typically did. And I really didn't think anything of it at the time I saw that study, but a couple weeks later, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I felt like the universe was trying to say something to me, nudge me in a way that I couldn't ignore, especially because my father was in the hospital. I mean, he was in a coma. It was a very scary situation. So in my head, this is irrational perhaps, but I said to God, like literally I was like sitting in the public bathroom at the hospital and you know, I was crying because my father had just received the news. And I said, okay, God, if you want me to give up meat, I'm giving up meat right now, but please just do what you can for my dad. So that's what I did, I gave up meat and uh, it wasn't very difficult for me at mm. all. It was actually kind of interesting and fun and ultimately I've created a career out of it, so. <laughs> Amazing. And one of the things you've written about is how I think maybe an unexpected part of cooking vegan is that you're now a food scientist because there are so <laughs> many ways that you want to um, perhaps imitate foods that you miss as a vegan. You have to know about different fats and starches and gelling and all of that sort of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that learning process? Yeah, so right before I went plant-based was actually when I started cooking a lot more, ironically, and it's actually not atypical. I was dating a guy who wanted to impress him. So I started cooking a lot more and I started spending a lot more time with his father, my late father-in-law, and he was an avid baker. He was really good at making just the most beautiful muffins, great pies and biscotti. You know, he's Italian and I wanted to impress him as well. So I started, my whole refrigerator was like every different kind of butter you can imagine, you know, and all the different flours in my pantry. And then just a few months later, I don't have any of those things anymore. I don't have butter, I don't have cream, I don't have eggs. And at that point, yes, um, vegan bakers, they know quite a bit more science than probably the average baker does because now they have to figure out ways to get things to rise without eggs, to replace the protein in eggs, to you know, get things to gel, to get things to stick, to get things to you know, um, not fall apart when it comes right out of the oven. I'm constantly looking at recipes for vegan souffles. Like, does it actually exist? <laughs> like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, things like this. So it's one of the fun parts about doing that. I will say at the very beginning, I was very um, discouraged because I was like, oh, how can I bake a genoise without eggs? Like, does, how is that possible? Um, but you know, 30 second attempts later and you find out that you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm curious about how you sort of look at veganism out in the world. Um, more and more people are interested in plant-based diets, whether it's fully vegan or not. More and more restaurants where you can eat a plant-based diet really easily. Um, do you look at that in a certain way as part of you know, a, a broader movement towards plant-based food? I do. Uh, I think that selfishly, I love it, right? Um, right before I went vegan, I went to Rome, Italy, which is where my husband's family is from. And it was great, you know, we ate all the different kinds of foods. And then we went again after going vegan. And I remember thinking, wow, there are lots of vegan options. And then we go back like three years later and it's like, insane the number of vegan options. I mean, there were vegan croissants at the airport. I, I couldn't wow. believe it. It was so wonderful. And that, of course, selfishly makes me feel great about the proliferation of vegan options at you know various retail commercial level, I think, that at, or at the restaurant level. 
I think what it speaks to more broadly is an awareness that we need to start taking ownership of our bodies, we need to start taking ownership of our communities, and we need to start taking ownership of our planet, right? I think that everyone is starting to realize that there is a cost to everything. There's a cost to us living and breathing on this planet. And what are the consequences of just that very action? What are the consequences of things that we so very much take for granted now? And are those consequences those that we're willing to pass on to generations after us, especially if we have children and we have families? And with that in mind, I think that adopting a more compassionate way of creating food on our planet to feed ourselves and our bodies and the children that come after us is, of course, a thing that I am very much in support of. However, I want it to be done with intention. <laughs> I want it to be done with compassion. Right. I think that's important. You write a lot about um and speak a lot about your, your relationship with your body. And we have a question from the audience. And folks, if you're interested in asking Joanne a question, you can submit it at sly.do and type in hashtag curated cuisine. So our question is, um, as an endurance athlete and vegan, any recommendations for fueling long runs? And if there's one recipe or a couple recipes in your book that you would recommend for that? Mm, well, OK, the first recipe that I would recommend is, the, is in the basics chapter, and that's rice. <laughs> um, so it's like my you know basic go-to rice. It's my everyday rice. It's, actually really beautiful um, because I include the forbidden black rice as part of my basic everyday rice as well as uh, pearled barley. So you get a lot of texture, you get a lot of good, yummy carbs. Um, as a long distance runner, especially if you are training right before an event like a half marathon or a full marathon, a very long distance, or you're doing a 20 miler or an 18 miler uh, as part of your training. I can't overstate enough based upon my own personal experience as well as a lot of you know, nerdy running research that I've done. Uh, carb loading is intense, it's serious. It means that you have to eschew other macros in favor of carbs. And that means that you can't really be adding too much fat. You can't be adding too much protein. So I think rice is about as perfect as it gets. It's a great carb. Uh, it's very, I don't think there's any fat in it. Um, and so it's a wonderful way to kind of bulk up and, and really restore any depleted glycogen from the rest of the week. I think um, sort of for like everyday kind of training to kind of keep you fueled, you do want to have a good level of protein in your diet. So one of my favorite recipes is the braised tofu or tofu chorin inside the, the book. Again, it's not very high in fat. It's got a ton of flavor. It's so easy to make. I would say the tubu chorim rice and then the kamja chorim, which is the braised uh, potatoes, those are my go-tos during the week. I love to make them. They're easy to make. They're fantastic for fueling your runs. And speaking of those famed potatoes, um, we have a, a video lined up. This is one of the first videos yes, you posted was. to TikTok. And um, we can hear uh, Anthony playing piano yes, in the background. Free recital. Yes. And, <laughs> and you tell this amazing story, um, which I can't wait for the audience to hear. Oh. The most wonderful sound in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you can see, I did not know how to use TikTok at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That technique I got from my aunt. Yum. Yes, that was my so first good. TikTok. It was so funny. Everybody in the comments knew exactly what Anthony was playing. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Right. And so now we're going to go to another video. Sorry, this was the one I was talking about mm -hmm. before. Um, a story about a trip with your mom to the grocery store. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I loved hearing this story, it reminded me of my own mom. I think you used the word combative, which I would say <laughs> is an excellent adjective. Yep. Um, so we're going to go to that video next. I often wonder where I get my combativeness from, and when I do, I think of this one day my mom and I went to the Korean grocery store, and we stopped at the Walnut Cookie Store to pick up some cookie. Now at the time, I was incredibly overweight, and next to my 90-pound mom, I looked even bigger than I normally would. We were standing in line paying for our walnut cookies when the woman standing behind us said in Korean, Ajuma, can I have some samples? And I had just tried a sample from the tray at the register, so I gestured to her, oh, here, here are the samples. And the woman says in Korean, oh, I don't want to touch anything that weird fat Chinese lady tried thinking that I couldn't understand her. As someone who's been overweight her entire life, this was probably one of the lowest experiences I'd ever had. And I just wanted to hide behind my 90 pound mother. When all of a sudden I hear my four foot 11 inch mom say, what did you say? You are a horrible, horrible person. She was screaming so much they had to escort her out of the store. And the best part is, it was in perfect English. Wow, I love that. And how, that video got 2.5 million views. No big deal. Um, so I really love the way that you talk about your relationship with your body and that there's so many ups and downs. What's it like to have 2.5 million folks hearing about some of these really painful stories that are that are really you know core memories for you i think on some level there's it's very cathartic to be sharing this um sometimes i like joke i'm like you all are my therapists like for free <laughs> um because i do get to unload some of the things that are in my heart that are burdening me but for the most part i would say including this story these are old stories. They happened to me many years ago. And, you know, one of the things that my creative writing teacher back when I was in high school, she always used to say, it's important to write what you know, but it's also important to give yourself some time to process these things, these stories before you share them. Because invariably, if you share them too soon, there's still a lot of things like, you know how you get too close to the to the, you know, I don't know, famous artist that does the thing, the murals where it's just like a lot of pinpoints and then you don't know what you're looking at until you kind of move back and you see the whole picture. It's the same sort of thing. If you haven't processed the emotions tied to a specific memory or a story, sometimes your ability to communicate that story is impaired. And so a lot of these stories that I'm sharing, they happened many years ago. I've already processed the emotions, the shame or the guilt that was you know, tied to that one. And all that I'm left with is just this immense pride for my mother, this immense love and appreciation for my tiny little mom and how she was just so like, I mean, she literally, they had to be like, you need to leave the store, ma'am, you know, in Korean, because she was so angry. And that's all I'm left with. And that's what I want to convey to, you know, 2.5 million followers is, gosh, I'm so lucky that I have such a great mom. And I hope that you have a great mom too. Or if you don't have, you know, the best relationship with your mom, that you have someone else in your life who would do this for you. And if you don't have someone else in your life, well, there's a, there's a person here who appreciates that, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's really what I wanted to get across. I also think there are a lot of people who could, especially, you know, Asian Americans, um, I feel like there's always like two sizes. There's like the size that's my mom and then there's the size that's more like me. And I feel like there are a lot of Asian American women who have reached out to me to say, oh my God, I so relate. My mom's 90 pounds, my mom's tiny, and I don't know how to interact with her sometimes because mm -hmm. I feel so large, like physically, you know? And so sharing that I think also creates kind of a, a moment of being seen for me and for them. I love that. We have a great audience question. As someone who has spoken about her history with body image, how do you approach veganism without succumbing to potential disordered eating? That's a great question. Yeah. It's one that my therapist asks me many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's very candid. I, that's one of the reasons I like her. She's like, you know, it's a form of restriction. And we're very anti-restriction in this space. So I do understand that. There are a couple of things. Um, number one, when I talk about body dysmorphia and when I talk about disordered eating, I try to be very mindful of 
the fact that even when I was struggling with that and continue to struggle with that, like any little thing could trigger me. Like even things that were intended to help me could trigger me. So I always try to be very careful about how I talk about this while also being honest. The honesty is that of all the things that I continue to talk about on my social media or in my book or anywhere else, this is the one issue that I probably continue to struggle with. It's not something that I have processed to resolution. So all of the other things I feel like, okay, you know, subject to, you know, current events like AAPI hate, obviously that's an ongoing issue that I continue to struggle with. This personal issue is one that I struggle with. Because of that, I try to be very responsible about what I share in that regard, because again, I don't want to trigger a relapse for anyone else. I think the, I mean, other thing is in terms of the specific question, as a vegan, I will say this, my whole life, my whole life was about calories in versus calories out. Every single thing that I did was about that. And then I decided to eat in a way that was about compassion. And all of a sudden, my consumption was about something different from calories in versus calories out. For once in my life, how I designed my plate, the food that I put in my body, could be an act of compassion, it could be an act of advocacy, it could be an act of empowerment, right? And that has really helped me to reframe the way that I view eating. Does it cure me? No. It doesn't, okay? And I don't know that there is a cure for my particular struggle, but it's certainly something that has armed me the next time I feel inclined to do something that might be harmful to my body. Wow. Um, I think, you know, your um, meteoric rise <laughs> has been really incredible over a really short period of time. And I think that in the last year, it seems like things have really coalesced for you. Um, I remember reading that after Joe Biden won the election, your, your Twitter persona, which is a little <laughs> spicier, more political, um, kind of collided with your TikTok and Instagram persona, which was more about food. And um, people let you know that they did not have the same political views as you. And then you went and shot a TikTok video that went viral where you explained the federal rules of civil <laughs> procedure because you are an attorney by, by training and you basically just roasted the crap out of people who said that they thought the election was fraudulent. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> That is just a, a moment of convergence that I think is so special. And um, we're going to go now to a video where you reflect on a year of posting to TikTok and what it means to be a creator. In case you don't know, I am a lawyer. When I was 22 years old, I told myself that I wasn't really that artistic and that I was better suited to a career that values analytical thinking, and so started my career as a lawyer in big law. Then one year ago today, I posted my very first real TikTok, and over the past year, I've gotten a chance to earn the title that was given to me by all of you, creator. I'm getting a little emotional just saying that because uh, you think that I'm a storyteller, a writer, an artist, and for so much of my life, I convinced myself that I wasn't creative at all, that art was something reserved for people who were far more talented and extraordinary than me. You all have changed my life, given me the confidence to pursue dreams I thought were long dead. One of those dreams, it arrived in a box the other day. I got to hold it in my hands, leaf through the pages containing my words, my stories, my photos. In a few months, you all will hold a copy of my heart in your hands and here I am today, one year from my very first TikTok, still astonished that this is my life, the life of a creator. I mean. <laughs> we can all just take a moment to wipe our tears away. Um, I read a, the Washington Post article on you and the author said, over the course of exactly 60 seconds, Molinaro somehow makes you want to laugh, cry, march in the streets, and devour every damn thing on her plate. And I think that one of the big themes of what you do is about hope, which is closely related to compassion, which you've talked about. Tell me about the role of hope in your everyday life and uh, how you go about this work. Yeah, well, I started sharing the stories about my mom and my dad because I felt so hopeless mm. and I hated that feeling. I watched everything that was happening on the news back in 2016 after the election 
particularly to Asian Americans. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do to make this situation better. What can one person possibly do? Should I just close up shop and move to a different country? Like, what do I mean? I know a lot of people wanted to do that, but that's just so not me. And so I started sharing the stories about my mom and my dad because I believed that maybe one, two, ten people would hear something about my mom standing up for me in English at a Korean cookie store, or my father's escape from North Korea, or how he struggled working at the United States Postal Service because everyone made fun of his English, including his daughter. You know, I, I hope that somebody would hear these stories and say, hmm. Maybe I just don't know everything I thought there is about what it means to be American. And so that's why I started sharing these stories. So it was because I was trying to inject hope in a situation that was so bereft of it in my life at that time. So every day, everything that I do is an affirmation, a sort of stubborn refusal to reject despair. Because despair, I always think despair is when you turn, you know, someone said despair is when you turn your back to God. And in my belief, despair is when you turn your back on yourself. You know, there's nothing left. And so I always try and think, you know, even with my struggle with eating disorder or even, you know, with AAPI hate, do I just close up shop and say, okay, I'm done. I don't, I'm, I'm going to resign myself to this. And I refuse to do that. So every small kernel of hope is, is what I choose to project. Hmm. What I'm hearing you say is that hope is a practice. Um, it is. It's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. Yeah. And that, that every day you make investments in having that view of the world. We have a question um, about for for people of color, for people who feel marginalized in, in our culture, what advice do you have for staying positive and, and practicing that kind of hope, especially when um, we're constantly bombarded with um, terrible things happening? That's a very difficult question. I think number one, it's okay to feel like crap. Like it is a crappy situation. Like even what we're going through right now with what happened in, in Buffalo, you know, what happened in Dallas, you know, what, what happened in Laguna Woods. Um, it's okay to feel despair in moments. It's okay to sit in your feelings of sadness and grief. In fact, it's not okay to ignore those feelings and, and continue pretending to be otherwise. That's where you end up in a situation. So I always say to people, number one, acknowledge your feelings, acknowledge your grief, allow yourself to mourn in the way that that manifests in your life, right? But then I think the way that I have created a situation that facilitates hope and affirmation is um, communicating. Like, I need to talk to people. I need to talk to the people who are close to me, whether that's my mom and my dad, and, and making sure that, hey, like, OK, we're on the same page about, like, if you go out, you need to have the spray thing, like, you know, things like that. Um, talking to my partner, my husband, and making sure that we're fleshing out issues that can be very difficult to talk about, particularly if you're in an interracial relationship. Some of the issues that we talk about end up in, in yelling matches. That's OK. Like, I need to communicate. And then finally, creating a space of like-minded individuals who might be suffering and struggling with the same issues, i.e. an Asian American community. For example, at work, I leaned heavily on the women of color group that you know the firm created for these types of issues. Like I was at every single meeting. We talked about our feelings. We talked about how it impacted our ability to show up at the office, to show up in court, to show up in largely white dominated spaces. What does that mean for us as women of color? So like leaning on those communities, I think allowed me to feel less alone. And I think isolation is probably the worst thing that can happen when you're feeling hopeless. And I think that what you create and put out in the world gives people an opportunity to lean on you. Well, that's, that's my hope. So lean on me, <laughs> lean on me. Like I do want people to feel like they are seen and that their stories are important, that they're, they're being heard, that um, your feelings are valid. 
If you're angry about what's happening, that's valid. If you feel sad about what's happening, that is valid. If you feel loss, immense loss from what we've all gone through over the past two and a half years, that is valid. And I want people to feel safe in expressing that. I think that one of my favorite sort of series that you've done on TikTok, I, I guess, for me, a lot of your work is about trauma, but it's also about talking about your process and, and how you've healed. And I don't think I ever would have thought about um, TikTok as a, a mode of healing, per se. But here you are um, with a, a series about you know, your Korean auntie. Um, and so we're going to go to a video from early 2021, Auntie Makes You Gimbap, Up. And it's just an incredible example of you. It's almost like therapy ASMR. Um, <laughs> it, it's really special. And so I'm, I'm really excited to go to that video. So when you get dumped, they're going to say things like, he wasn't good enough for you anyway. He was stupid. This is a blessing in disguise. Let's cut through the bullshit. It sucks to lose somebody that you felt so connected to. You see, when you love someone, whether for five minutes or five years, they have the power to bring out the best in you. So when that person stops loving you, you're not just mourning the loss of that person, but you're mourning the loss of the person you used to be when they were with you. They say live your best life. But the truth is we're all looking for that one person who lets us live our best self. You may feel wrung out and squeezed right now, but your grief is actually a testament to the thing that makes you so precious, your vulnerability. Now love may bring out the best in you, but here's the thing, babe, the best in you has been in there all along, and it will be there when you finally find someone who's worth only the very best. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> wow. Like, it feels like you're talking straight to the person watching. Something you said in an interview is that people who watch you on TikTok, they crave mom energy. Yes. Um, I got a lot of mom energy in that one. And I think that that is why it's healing to watch these videos too. It's so special. Well, I, I watched a lot of of that kind of videos myself, and I found myself moved by them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that, they're called POV, uh, tash, hashtag POV on, on TikTok. There are a lot of those, and I found them to be very moving, and you know, I wanted to create a series inspired by my nephew, who's only four years old right now, but these are the conversations I look forward to having with him. We have another great question from the audience. How has your Korean family responded to your vegan Korean cooking? I bet you get this question a lot. <laughs> Do you still feel like you are sometimes sacrificing community or family um, with the way you eat? I do. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Mm. I don't like sugarcoating things. Um, I think there are some vegans that are like, everything's the same. <laughs> everything's the same, nothing's changed, except for, you know, I don't eat animal products anymore. And that's just not true, and at least not in my life. You know, I recently had my family over to help me move in LA. I just transferred from Chicago to LA and my family was there. And there are, my mother is phenomenal. I, I do feel like in many ways I have grown so much closer to my mom and my dad um, because of this journey towards veganizing Korean food because it it required me to spend more time with her. Like I was like, I need to know how you how do you do this? Like how do you make this broth so good and mine sucks? Like I want to know all these things and oh the, tell me the story about why you love sweet potatoes and daddy why do you like naengmyeon so much? You know okay how do I make mine better? So these things brought me closer. But the thing that I continue to miss is. Um, those huge family dinners at the Korean barbecue restaurant, you know, or going to our favorite naengmyeon jjit, and we all sit together, we all order the same thing, and we talk, and we laugh, and you know, oh, you're gonna eat another plate, ha <laughs> ha, you know, stuff like that. I miss that so much, and um, I do feel like my cousins, they don't know how to deal with my veganism. They, it, either they just make fun of it or they ignore it. And so what that means is that I cannot participate in that kind of comfortable fellowship that we used to have. And that, like, I'll be very honest, that hurts my feelings. It hurts my feelings. I've, I've said this before. Like, it's literally brought me close to tears on many times because mm -hmm. I love my cousins so much and I feel like I have to grieve over that, especially when it occurs many, many times. I will say like one of the things that I've thought about a lot, and it might be in a newsletter at some point, is this idea of like, you know, I want to tell my cousins like, 
me creating um, vegan versions, like I'm not trying to make this food taste as exactly the same as the food that we used to eat. Like that's not the point. And you're right, you guys might be right. My food may not be as delicious as the place where you go to get your sundubuchige or your, you know, papingsu. I think it tastes amazing, but they may disagree, fine. That's still not the point. I am choosing this for reasons that have largely nothing to do with taste, okay? I'm doing this because for me, the mental tax associated with eating animals is no longer worth the taste, okay? It just isn't. So you guys eat what you wanna eat. For me, this is the way I wanna eat. And if that means that I can no longer break bread with you in the way that I used to, so be it. That is my choice. I am owning that choice. So that is a tougher conversation that perhaps we'll have when they're a little bit older and they're maybe a little bit more mature. But yes, it is something that I think about a lot. And it's also something that's tricky because I do think there are a lot of people who say my whole point as a vegan chef is to literally replicate the same taste, same texture, everything the same so that people don't miss it. I God love them for doing that because that is important work, I think, but that's not the kind of work that I intend to do. Mm. That's all about sort of authenticity, that old chestnut. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think what, what I love about the way you write about veganism is that it's it's about being authentic to you, mm -hmm. who you are, what your values are, and your sense that the way you eat now brings you more into alignment with yourself. Yes. And I, I think that's really special. We have another question about um, on the topic of hope and sustainability. How do you stay hopeful that your veganism is helping the planet um, and is environmentally conscientious? Yes, that's a great question. When I first started exploring plant-based diets, again, because of you know my husband, Anthony, I literally had no idea the impact um, Big Ag was having on our planet. I, I never made the connection between being meatless and being green like that because quite frankly, I just was one of those, you know, professional persons who was like, I recycle, I'm good, okay? Like that's what I thought, right? And, and then this whole world opened up to me after watching Cowspiracy. You know, whether or not you agree with the complete accuracy and veracity of all of the little factoids that they include in that movie, it is indisputable that there is certainly some impact on the planet from Big Ack, right? And that that impact can be mitigated simply by changing the way that you eat. So my question then, again, as a skeptic was like, really? Like, you know, what, what role do I, as an individual again, what role do I have in this? And if it really is that bad, do I just, again, hang out my shingle and say, you know what, I'm moving to Sardinia, I'm gonna live out a quiet life and enjoy the planet while it's still here. Is that what I'm supposed to, I'm not, you know, so I mean, is that sort of the answer? So I actually did some Googling Google's great. And I um, found this study. I literally was just talking about this study with uh, Alyssa, our, our, our you know, penguin um, publicist. I love this study because I was wondering, like, is it just like government and corporations? Are they the only ones who can do anything about it? Or do I actually have some impact? And the study was fantastic. It actually pulled together like 140 other studies on climate change. And what it noted was number one, that 50% of carbon emissions are actually a result of individual actions, right? Which means that individual actions can make some pretty significant difference. And then it distilled four things that individuals can do in order to mitigate their their carbon footprint, and one of them was eating a plant-based diet. And I thought that was so, it was exactly what this questioner is asking. It gave me a breath of hope, like, oh, okay, there is something that I can do. I shouldn't just despair, because really the temptation to despair when it comes to climate change is quite high. Um, you know, especially with the things that are happening with, you know, people's literacy on this issue, the government's literacy on this issue, their unwillingness to do something about it can be very, very troubling. But when you realize that, hey, me switching out this, you know, regular hamburger for Beyond Meat Burger, an Impossible Burger, a few times a week can make that much of a difference, wow. It's empowering. It, you feel like you can do something about that. Hope and empowerment, they go hand in hand. I've been feeling very inspired. Yes. Um, so Eat an Impossible Burger. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do one more question and then go to the demo. And this is a very practical question about how to woo non-vegans. Mm. 
So what's your go-to recipe to wow non-vegans if you're having a dinner party? This is what the, the, the person asking this question really struggles with. Uh, I would say my kampung tofu recipe is like my most popular recipe on YouTube and elsewhere. I have heard so many people who are like die-hard carnivores who hate tofu eat this dish and they're like, oh my gosh, this is like restaurant good. It's really, really good. It's very easy to make. It's a take on one of my favorite Chinese, like fusion Chinese dishes that I used to eat all the time growing up called kampungi, which is um, a Korean Chinese fried chicken. And I wanted to create a version that retained all of those same flavors and even some of that texture. I just used you know, tofu instead of chicken. And it's so, so good. And it's always a hit. You, you can't eat this and be like, yeah, this sucks. I don't want to eat this ever again. <laughs> like, it just like never happens. Well, now I'm very hungry. Let's go cook something. Yes, yes. Right. Well, I'm very excited. Yay. <laughs> all right. So this is cucumber kimchi, which I've actually talked about. If you follow me on TikTok, then you'll notice that I did a recent TikTok on this because it's racing through the internet right now. It's very popular for all sorts of interesting reasons, which we don't have to get into. But this cucumber kimchi, I used to call, and I still call like kimchi for noobs um, or newbies uh, because like kimchi can be a little intimidating. Um, you know, one of the first things that people ask me to veganize when I started the Korean vegan was kimchi. And I was always like, mm, I don't know. It's like a really intense thing. It's like a, at least five hours of your day. You got to get, you know, a group of women with you and like we're willing to squat on the ground. With you. It's like a big thing, you know. Um, and so I was kind of like hesitant. So I actually came up with this recipe because I was like, this is really easy. It doesn't take more than one person to do it. It doesn't take four hours. The pickling process is so quick. You can eat it directly right out of the bowl after you're done or you can save it for you know later in the week if you want but you start out with these like Persian cucumbers they're like or pickling cucumbers if you go to the Korean grocery store they have specific cucumbers for this particular kimchi you can ask the person to help you find them or look for the ones that say like pickling cucumbers and you'll find them or if you can't find those like I said these Persian ones are great and what you're gonna do is you're just gonna slice them and the recipe calls for about a pound of these and you're gonna slice them into about a quarter inch thick pieces like this right I always like can't help but eat them when I'm slicing <laughs> them. Mm. and part of that is because you do want to check for the flavor um, they should be crunchy but they should also be like slightly sweet which is kind of like this the sweet spot that I like to go for um, I think this recipe always starts with really good cucumbers. The better the cucumbers, the better this cucumber kimchi is going to taste. I remember once I made it with cucumbers that was like really bad and it was not salvageable. So you do want to try them. So we do the like one fourth inch thick like little rounds here and then you put it into a bowl. And then what you're going to do is in the cookbook, I describe the, you know, the multi-level process of kimchifying anything basically. And the first part is always the salting because you need to draw out the excess liquid. And so we've got here three tablespoons of salt. And I do want to spend a little bit of time just talking about the salt. This is not when you bust out your table salt, OK? Because that is not going to work very well. That salt is too fine. And what it's going to do is going to get absorbed directly by the vegetable, as opposed to a coarse sea salt, what you want. So we're going to put in three tablespoons of that. Now, some people have said, that's too salty. OK, I, I get you. I understand. But the salt actually creates sort of um, the process of osmosis, right? It's there to draw out the liquid. And you are going to rinse these cucumbers after the pickling process to get rid of the excessive saltiness. If you try this recipe and you say, still too salty, I don't like it, and then use maybe two tablespoons of salt. But I found that three tablespoons really does kind of hit the spot. My mom probably would use four tablespoons, but that's because she really likes salty kimchi. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Now we're just going to like mix it up here. Of course, if I were like, you know, in ajima mode, I would be using my hands. But, um, you know, you can mix it up using a spoon, using a spatula like this. All you want to do is make sure that we're evenly coated here. And again, the salt is going to help draw out the excess liquid. We're going to set this aside for about, like, I don't remember what the book calls for, but anywhere from like 20 to 45 minutes, I would say, right? And what you want is you want this sort of texture at the end of the day. So we're going to, let's take one of these for comparison, right? I can, like, it's very stiff. 
That's what, that's what we got in the beginning. But then at the end of the pickling process, you got like this bendiness. This is what you want to go for. And again, give it a try. Perfect. You I love that? it. Mm. <laughs> so good. Like I could just eat it like this. This and rice would be like perfect meal. But that's not what we're going to do. This is so good just as is. And this has been rinsed thoroughly to get rid of the excess salt, but keeping that sort of wonderful bendy quality to our texture. And then we're going to add all the different aromatics and our flavor. So aromatics, I love red onion. Uh, red onion is not used as much in Korean cooking. At least my mom has not used it very often. This is sort of my like, hey, like Joannifying these types of things. I love red onion because the red is actually the pigment that signifies the antioxidant value of this particular vegetable. So when you're looking at your vegetables, the ones that are more colorful, the ones that are more vibrant, they are going to have more antioxidant buck bang for your buck, right? So I like to use red onions as much as I can. I also like the zip kind of that, you know, it gives as opposed to some of our milder onions. So that's what we're gonna do here. We've got a quarter cup of our red onions. And then we're gonna add sort of the iconic, like, you know, kimchi spice. This is gochukaru. Um, oh yeah, great. So gochukaru <laughs> is, uh, you know, this is the, you know, this is the Korean pepper powder. That's what it's often called, or Korean chili powder. Um, one of the great things about this, and, and you should be aware of this, is on the back of most gochukarus, you're gonna see how spicy it is. There's a bar that indicates the level of spice. This one's right in the middle. They obviously you are better able to gauge your own tolerance for heat and what this actually correlates to. Like for my mom, this would be like more like here, but for me, it would be like over here, like danger zone, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, we're gonna add three tablespoons, three or four, no, four tablespoons here. If you are not that great with spices yet, you're working on that tolerance level, <laughs> then you know maybe do two tablespoons or even one tablespoon. Like I said, this would have been good enough in my estimation without any kochukaru at all, right? But we're gonna add that. We're also gonna add some sweetness. I've got here two tablespoons of sugar. You could also use like plum syrup. You can use a maple syrup, which you know, if you have the cookbook, you know I, I use a lot of maple syrup in my cooking. Um, you can use brown rice syrup, which is another one of my favorite sweeteners, agave syrup. But I'm using sugar here just because it cuts down on sort of the liquid. One tip that I did not have when I was writing this cookbook, I was just talking to my mom about this the other day. She was like, when you use sugar, I mean, how many of you cook with sugar and water before? Yeah, so what happens? It turns into a syrup. It gets really thick, right? So over time, if you don't eat this like instantly, over time, what happens is that the liquid, the pickling juice actually gets kind of syrupy and thick, which maybe you like, but a lot of people don't. So my mom has said, actually, your grandma used to use uh, sweet and low instead of real sugar. <laughs> she would literally like hoard them from the cafes, and, like take them home with her and then like open them up into her kimchi. That's what she would use in order to avoid that sort of syrupy liquid texture. So that's another possibility. We just made our kaktugi with uh, sweet and low and it tasted absolutely amazing. <laughs> kaktugi is a radish kimchi. So we've got our sweetener in here. And we got a couple of other things to add a little bit of acid, right? We do want a little bit of acidity and tartness to our kimchi. So we're gonna add some mirin, which is like sweet rice wine. We're gonna add probably like a couple tablespoons of that. And then we're also gonna add a couple tablespoons of rice vinegar. And that is going to give this uh, cucumber kimchi that like requisite like tartness. So one of the things that I have come across in, you know, just kind of researching this is, well, what is the difference between like kimchi and muchim? Has anyone ever come across that sort of dilemma? Have you ever come across muchim versus kimchi? I do not know the answer to this question. Yeah, so a friend of mine like wrote this beautiful essay on kimchi as a verb. And he told me that, you know, some people were like, well, there's a fine distinction between kimchi and muchim, which is seasoned vegetables. And so, and that came up as well when I was doing the research. Muchim is seasoned, right? Which means that you're going to see some type of fat that's being added to this so that the fat sort of, um, I think it actually changes the pickling process and turns it into a much more seasoned vegetable. So if you see in the cookbook, kale muchim, 
You're going to see sesame seeds. You're going to see a little bit of sesame oil. You're going to see tenjang, which is the fermented miso paste, which also has fat in it. That's going to bind with the vegetable to create this sort of emulsification that's really luxurious and rich, whereas this one has no fat in it. We're not even putting toasted sesame seeds in this, which is, you know, it does have fat in it. And what it does is it creates a, a palate refresher, right? It's very refreshing. It's crunchy. It's acidic. It's bright. That's the kind of flavor and texture that we're going for here with this cucumber kimchi. And that is basically it with this recipe. How easy was that, right? Basically, everyone could do it, right? Everyone could do it. This is so easy, and it tastes great. It tastes so good. Here we go. Yum. Yes. I would eat this with rice, if your question is. When do you, <laughs> I would eat this with a bowl of rice, and with I would eat, yes, and I would eat it immediately. Like, this is good immediately, because you've already done the pickling process here in the, you know, 20 to 45 minutes where it was getting bendy. You got it. But it's also good the day after. It's good the day after that. It's good the day after that. It's, it's really just wonderful. Right. It smells delicious. Yes. And I think there right. are a couple of snacks for all of us. Yes, yeah. So uh, the team at, at Boston University, they have this beautiful culinary program there where they actually teach students how to cook, which I think is so amazing. Um, they you know, partner with WBR to bring some of these recipes to life. And so I believe they made some of this kimchi for you all to try, as well as my red bean cookies, my um, chocolate chip pot cookies. I'm one of those persons who literally like looks for ways to put pot in everything. <laughs> so I was like, oh, cookies, I'll put some red beans in it. And uh, that's what they did. Oh, yeah, this is a uh this is pot that you can find in a bag, which I've never seen Not before. Not that pot. This yeah, pot. this is this is the legal in every jurisdiction uh, pot. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is you're never gonna get into trouble with this one. Um, and you can find this at your Asian grocery store. A lot of times you'll find them in cans, but apparently here in the Boston area, you'll also find them in bags in the frozen foods aisle in the in the refrigerated section. Um, it's sweet red bean paste and. It is a very light taste in these cookies. It's not meant to overpower it at all. So I hope you all enjoy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank Joanne. you, this Irene. Is so fun. Yeah, no, I had a great time. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Wow, thank you guys. That if you don't have the smell, just it's <laughs> so good. Thank you so yes. much. That was wonderful. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Really fun. It's so great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And thank you to Irene for excellent moderating, all, yes. as always. She was it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming out and to our virtual audiences coming up uh, next at City Space. One quick note join us for a conversation about growing a sustainable food system in New England and your backyard. We'll have a planting demonstration and a farmer's market in that lobby. Um, that's Wednesday, June 8th at 6 30. Find tickets at wbur.org slash events. And as Joanne mentioned you're going to be able to taste some of this excellent uh, Korean vegan food out in the lobby and uh, Joanne is kindly going to sign some copies of her books. Thank you all. Thank you.